Father, bless us now as we preach, teach the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were with us Thursday night, we, we took the time, the Thursday night teaching was dedicated to what our Lord was not saying when our Lord said, judge not. We mentioned the fact that Matthew's gospel chapter 7 and verse 1, judge not, is now the most popular scripture in the world. It has surpassed John 3.16. For a long time, John 3.16 was number one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. It has been surpassed and surpassed big time by Matthew's gospel chapter 7 and verse 1, but it has been surpassed basically because uh, of people's misunderstanding of what it is that our Lord is actually saying. They th teach the world, the left, people who want to do whatever they want to do. They misinterpret this passage, misconstrue it uh, to mean that you should have no opinion whatsoever on their actions. That, that we should not uh, give a distinction between right and wrong, good and bad, um, better and best. That we should have nothing to say about that. They're wrong. It is not possible for Jesus to tell his disciples to be wise as serpents and then tell them to totally do away with their critical faculty to be able to lose the ability to analyze, to look at a thing critically and see what is right and what is wrong. There is still such a thing as right and wrong. Someone said the other day on a particular radio station that I will not name, that they're trying to build a bridge. We're trying to bridge the gap between the world and the church. If someone is trying to bridge that gap, it is wrong to do that. For the Bible says that we are to put a difference between holy and unholy, clean and unclean. So actually we're supposed to blow up the bridge between the world and the church. Unless the world come over and the world wants to be saved. The Bible asks the question, what fellowship have light with darkness? Have righteousness with unrighteousness? The Bible tells us that not to, to build a bridge, but we're to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Now, one of the ways we know that the Lord was not saying, do not exercise your ability to discern the difference between right and wrong is what the Lord says in our text. The Lord says in our text that we're not to give that verse 6, which is holy, unto dogs. Well, verse 6 was not speaking of canine. He was speaking of people. And he says, cast not your pearl before, pearls before the swines. He was talking about people. Well, if you can't judge, if you can't make any distinctions between people's actions, then how are you going to determine whether or not a person is a dog or a good person? Or is there such a thing as a, a dogish individual and a good person? Amen. The only way you can determine whether or not you're dealing with a swine or someone who needs to be delivered is to have the ability to make distinctions. Amen. Also, the word judge. I said Thursday night, I don't teach all Greek words to you because, I mean, if you've got a whole bunch of syllables, you're not going to remember the word anyway. But you'll remember this one. The word is krino. 
Crino judge, K R I N O. The, the root, the basic word in the word judge is the word uh, separate or to divide, to divide, to separate, to make distinctions, to come to decisions. So you know the Lord could have been saying, even when you read everything else that he has said, that we're not to make a distinction between right and wrong. That would make no sense. How could he warn us in verse 15 of this same chapter to beware of false prophets if we can't distinguish between the true prophet and the false prophet? It makes no sense. So he couldn't have been saying, have no opinions about anything. It couldn't be, it couldn't be a situation where he's simply saying, uh, uh, there is no such thing as right, there is no such thing as wrong, Every, all actions and all deeds are the same. If that's the case, then there's also no, no such thing as sin. And there's no such thing as being lost. And if there's no such thing as sin and no such thing as being lost, then there, there was no need for Christ to come and to die on the cross. There's no, such, there's no need for religion. There's no need for any of this if, there, if there's no sin. What, what did he shed his blood for? You, do, you, do you follow what I'm saying? See, you, you got to think about this stuff. And then those in the world who says, I don't judge, or in most cases, the most judgmental people, because here's what they say. They say, I don't judge, but I'm not like those hypocritical Christians who judge everybody. They just judged us. I don't make judgments. That statement is a judgment in and of itself. For you have said that you deem no actions worthy of distinctions of deciding whether or not this action is right or wrong. The, the, the main person who screamed, I don't judge, let their husband cheat on them. I don't judge. All right, then let that man have your wife. See if you're going to judge that. T tell me if that's all right. Let somebody rape your child since you don't judge. Of course you judge. Of course we make distinctions. You can't live without making distinctions and, and the ability to decide. If you lose the ability to decide and the ability to discern, you will be lost in this world. You won't, you won't even be able to get home from church today. Because when that light turns red, you got to make a distinction. You've got to separate between red, yellow, and green. Now, some of you, you know that green means go, red means stop, but some of you have judged yellow to mean speed up. But I'm telling you, that's not always a good distinction. The word crino also means to make, to judge in a judicial manner the judges in the courtroom. It also means to pronounce a sentence to judge. It also means to condemn, to finish a matter or occasions also to condemn. So the Lord, the sense in which the Lord meant, used the word here was to, uh, to prejudge. So I want to tell you what, he's, what he is telling us. When the Lord says judge not, a good passage of scripture that gives us an example of what the Lord was warning us not to do can be found in Romans chapter 14. Romans the 14th chapter, and I'll read in your hearing, the 10th through the 13th verse is a good example of what the Lord was telling us in Matthew's gospel, chapter 7, verse 1 and down, not to do. If you love the Bible today, you'll be blessed by this presentation. If you don't, just yawn through it. <laughs> Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, and verse 10 says, But Romans, I'm sorry, Romans, I'm sorry, 14 and 10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Now, the thou here that he's speaking to, oddly enough, are a Christian's to whom the Apostle Paul called weak. 
in verse 3 of chapter 14, it says, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Let's back up so you get a full understanding. It says, him, verse 1, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. Says that brother uh, in the faith who is weak, receive him, but not to uh, disputeful arguments. Don't uh, receive your Christian brother and you're fussing uh, about them and you're arguing and, and you're arguing, arguing about non-essential differences. There are differences that we have from one another in the body of Christ that are in the category of non-essential. Somebody wants, uh, some lady likes to wear her hair up. Another lady likes to wear her hair down. Uh, someone uh, likes, to, they, they like being a brunette. Somebody wants to be a, a blonde and, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, people can be different there. Those are non-essential differences. Amen. Some, some will have the communion in the Sunday morning service. Somebody will have it in the Sunday night service. There's a difference, but that is a non-essential difference. So you don't receive each other arguing about non-essentials. And, and, and then when you do have a non-essential conversation, it should be he had or held as a non-essential conversation. I wish my, my second assistant, uh, Elder Anthony Wilson, was wise enough to come over and, and, and pull for the dolphins and join me, even though the Dolphins hadn't won anything in a long time, but he insists on hanging with them boys. <laughs> so, so, but when we talk about it, we talk about it like it's something light. We're not going to fight. He's not going to leave the church. I'm not going to excommunicate him. You follow me? That's, that's non-essential. And this is what Paul is talking about. Non-essential. You want to wear, a, unless it's official day, <laughs> you want to wear a blue suit, someone else wears a black suit, that's non-essential. Amen. That's non-essential. A person is not going to go um, to hell over non-essential. So you can't look at a person and, and she has her toes out uh, but she has no shoes, and well, even if she has no shoes on at all, you can't say they're not saved. If they're barefooted, you might want to find out why, and maybe, maybe you could help them out. And, you know, instead of saying you're going to hell because you're at church with no shoes on, what, what would you say then if they looked at you and said, I don't have money for shoes? They could you'd be able to buy you for a penny then, right? That's, that's non-essential. Help them out. Amen. And then when you help them out, and you can go buy the shoe, and uh, buy them, if you can now, buy them a shoe that they like. <laughs> you know, don't go and get something that, yeah, well, I, <laughs> well, I'm going to help you, but you got to wear my kind. So you, you have the teenager dressing like the church mother and, uh, and, and vice, and then sometimes vice versa. So you don't want to do that. And uh, so what he's talking about is, are things like that, doubtful disputation about non-essential difference. Now what's not a non-essential is this is not a conversation here about adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, thievery, Murder, abortion, those aren't non-essential differences. The cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those aren't non-essential differences. If, you, if you're here and you don't believe that Jesus died and rose again, we have a major difference. And if you're a member of the church 
And uh, you won't be for long unless you change on that because these are foundational truths and we have to agree on the foundational truths. So there is a difference between essential and non-essential differences. Well, Pastor, the Lord convicted me. I don't wear any makeup at all. The Lord brought me out of it. That's great. What a, what a mighty move of God. But you can't, you, can't, you can't preach that for everyone else. And you can't assume that the next person is not saved like the Bible said because they're not convicted or don't share that. There's a difference there but it's not essential. A younger woman who's a young maiden and she's got a young husband, you know, she wants to dress accordingly. To keep that young man looking in her direction. He's young and full of testosterone. The wind blowing. Oh, Lord. All right, now you can't, you can't expect her to then, in, in terms of appearance and fashion, to go to the store in the section that's not made for her and put that on, and still she wants to keep her husband. I'm teaching you the difference between non-essential and essential differences. Now some of you are getting uncomfortable. If you shouldn't. Sometimes it's good to talk about these things because they get confusing. Honey child, I wouldn't put that on, but, but what did you put on when you were her age? Or when you were his age? See, that's, you know. Again, I'm not talking about being obscene or vulgar. You already know. We've already, we already preached about not having your pants hanging off your rear end. We already talk about, you know, uh, not showing what shouldn't be shown. So that's already covered. It it take too long to cover everything. I'm, I'm assuming that I'm building on, I'm talking to people who follow me long enough to, to, to not act, to not, to not come walk away with a silly conclusion. So is the pastor saying we don't have to look holy no more? <laughs> Bang! You already, you already know better than that. But non-essential differences. It says his non-essential, verse 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things. And another who is weak eateth herbs only. So that is one man that give, give me the hamburger. Uh, uh, yes, the beef. I, <laughs> Uh, I want I want the beef, uh, yes, and the uh, the pork, and uh, hand it here, baby back ribs, you name it. He believes that he can eat whatever is put before him if he bless it in the name of the Lord, and it doesn't convict his spirit. Then there's another person whom Paul calls weak in the faith, who who believe that. It's, you know, it's maybe a sin for them to eat anyth anything other than herbs. Now, if y'all go out to eat together, <laughs> let the person enjoy the hamburger. <laughs> you <laughs> you going you to eat that? <laughs> they ordered it, didn't they? Didn't they? Uh, honey, if you just, you don't know like I know. Well, well don't tell me right now. Let me... Let, let me finish this and enjoy my meal. Praise the Lord. Honey, I don't, I don't eat anything myself. <laughs> but uh, salad. All right. <laughs> enjoy it. But all I see is dressing. <laughs> Drown the thing. And typically people who are overly strict like that, give them three months. Go out to eat with them again. They have all that stuff stacked right back on their plate. And you, you know, you're scared to ask what happened. You just, just, God. 
So one believes that he can eat herbs, that is, uh, vegetables only. And you have to admit, uh, the vegetarians now, uh, people who are vegetarians, vegans, they, they walk in the air of superiority. Yes, I am a, I'm a vegetarian. I, I don't eat meat anymore. Okay, well, good. Let me have, I'll take the, you know, amen. I, I'm going to bless the food, eat in, in moderation. Praise the Lord. Uh, well, that didn't agree with me. Okay, well, then don't you eat it. But it agrees with me. Don't give me a problem at all. So, we, we, matter of fact, we have a ball. We have good fellowship. <laughs> when I eat it, it talks back. Mmm, good. <laughs> you got to know how to get along. So the, the, the point is, you never let something that shouldn't divide you, divide you. Amen. You shouldn't do that. Amen. I don't eat bread, someone said. I, asked, I was at an affair last night, and I asked the pre people at the table. I was at the head table. I was the guest speaker. I said, is there anything any better than bread and butter? You get the butter, the bread's a little warm. You just slather the butter on it. My God. I better hush. Some of y'all won't hear the rest of the sermon. And you just, oh, my. That's just good. You don't eat too much of it. My wife got on me one time. Because I was putting all the butter on the bread. And she's trying to keep me alive. So I said, okay, I'll cut back. Amen. And at home, she has that uh, smart beat. And that's good. It's good for you and all that. But uh, just that good old from heaven butter, you know, the kind that uh, back in the day, I bite into it. And I think about when I was a little boy. My mom used to make biscuits and grape jelly and put butter on it. I told you it's a different kind of sermon. But I'm trying to teach you, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate. I'm really not talking about bread and butter. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him uh, that eateth. For God has received him. Both are saved. So verse 10 says, why? But why dost thou judge thy brother? And why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As it is written, as I live, saith the Lord. See, when you judge people improperly, you play God. And you're assuming authority that you do not have. You're assuming that you're qualified to do that that only God is qualified to do. Now, you got to get Thursday night to know what Jesus wasn't talking about. But I want to show you what he was speaking of. He says, for, we, for as I live, uh, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me to the Lord, and every tongue shall confess to God, not to your brothers or your sisters. Amen. So then, let every one of us, so then let every one of us, so then, excuse me, every one of us shall give an account, notice this, while you're paying attention to your brother, Every one of us will give an account that this is going to just kill you of himself to God. You're not going to be able to get up on, on that day and talk to God about anybody but yourself. Well, Lord, that sister over there, uh uh, that brother, that preacher, that, no, you, you're going to have to tell God on that day. And, and God has truth serum. You ain't going to be able to lie about anything because you, you, you're standing before God and you could, you'll only be able to give an account of yourself. This is why self-righteous folk, you got to watch it because whereas you see the fault in everyone else, you don't see the fault in yourself. And the only person that you're going to give an account to God for 
is yourself. You're not going to give an account to God for your husband. You're not going to give an account to God for your wife. You're not going to give an account to God. Uh, you're not going to be able to talk about him on that day about the people who did you wrong. Guess what? I, I got, I'm going to disappoint you. You won't be able to stand up and talk to God that day about your haters. Now, some of you, I know what some of you are saying now. Well, I just might well just be lost then. <laughs> you probably will if you don't get this and understand what God is saying. Every man shall give an account of himself to God. So let us not judge, look at this, one another anymore. But judge this, that no man put an occasion, put a stumbling block on occasion to fall in his brother's way. Let's, con let's, let's come to the conclusion that we're going to help each other stay safe. Help each other stay in the church. Help each other grow. Yeah, that we're going to help each other make it. Yes, this is what our Lord is saying. Are you with me? Yeah. Here he is speaking against premature, the premature passing of judgment. Look at 1 Corinthians. Now stay with me for a few minutes, will you? 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to call your attention to verse uh, five, but to, for you to, to understand it fully, let me let, let allow me to start with verse one, and I'll read it quickly. It says, "Let a man so account of us." I preached from this passage not long ago, as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. You see that? Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be faithful, be dependable. Now, let me get to where I want to get to. But with me. It is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. He says to the saints at Corinth, it's a small thing, Paul says, that any of you would dare evaluate me. Or of man's judgment. It is small, it's a small thing that I be judged of you, evaluated by you, or of any man's court. I judge not my own self. Look at this. He says, now, for I know nothing by myself. Now, notice this. He says, I judge not my own self. But then he says this. I don't know of anything that I'm doing that someone could bring charges against me for. That's what I judge not my own self means. He says, I judge not my own self, yet am I not hereby justified. This is an awesome point. He says, I don't know of what charges that someone could bring against me, but that still doesn't mean I'm right. Now, I want, I want that to sink in because, see, many of us think we're always right. Just because you're not aware of what's wrong doesn't mean that there's not something wrong. It just means you're blind to it. While we're pointing at someone else, you got to know that somebody's pointing at you. So Paul says here, and he was being honest, he says, I can't think of any infractions that I'm guilty of, but that doesn't mean that I'm not guilty of any. It just means that I don't see it. Well, what weaknesses do you have? Well, I don't think I have any weaknesses. What? <laughs> a better answer may be, I'm, I, I, I may not be aware of them, but I'm sure that I have them. Now, you know, you, 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 you're almost where you ought to be. Because the Bible says, as for our sins, we know them. Paul says here. Now, I'm not sure. He says, but I, 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 that, that doesn't mean that I'm justified. But he that judge me, the judgment that I am, Trusting, it's not my own, but I'm trusting the Lord's judgment. Therefore, here's what Jesus was saying in Matthew's gospel, chapter 7 and verse 1. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. He's warning against pre the premature passing of judgment. Don't look at someone who's struggling today and write them off. 
God bless you, brother, with that NC State shirt on. I don't know you. I'm glad you're here. But I can't look at him and say, well, he's, a, he's, he's no good just singling you out. I hadn't even met him. Glad you're here. Don't know his name. But you can't prematurely pass judgment. Are you with me? Some of us actually look at people and just write them off. Well, I know they're not saved. How do you know? They can't be. How do you know? Well, the Lord revealed it to me. I'm going back to my original question. How do you know? Because you hadn't answered that yet. Because that's a non-answer. That's judgment. <coughs> I hold that there are going to be a lot of people in the kingdom sitting at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that we thought weren't going to be there. And many whom we assume will be at the head table will not. This is why you can't write people off. People, 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 get, people can get right late in the evening. If they're watching my television, I, I have some school teachers that I sure would like to meet today. Especially the one who told me that I was a clown. And I guess some of you still <laughs> agree with him. <laughs> I had one to tell me, you're just a clown. You're a clown. Matter of fact, I saw him years later. And uh, I shook his hand. And, I t and you know how I remembered it? And I said to him, I'm a, how'd the clown turn out? And he told me he was proud of me. That, that blessed me. Don't prematurely judge. You may, you may know something about somebody. You may have something on them. I know they're no good because here's what he or she did. The blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. A person can get right with God. And while you're holding that against them, they're just going up, 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 up. And you're sitting there mad getting nowhere fast because you won't let go. Well, I know they did. Yeah, they did it. But God. All of us did something. This is what he's teaching against. The premature passing of judgment. The Bible says, uh, judge nothing before the time. Well, what time? Until the Lord come. So you can't come to a conclusion until Jesus come. Well, I know they went to hell. How do you know? Unless you've gone. And I know you haven't because nobody goes and comes back. So if you're standing here talking to me, you're judging. You're doing what Jesus said not to do. Can I get a witness? I guess not today. He says, judge nothing before the time till the Lord come, who both shall bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will, look at this, make manifest the counsels of the heart. None of us can judge another person's heart. No, you know, you, before you can accurately come to certain conclusions, you, you got to, you, you won't like me, but you got to walk a mile. Sometimes in someone else's shoes. You meet somebody and, oh, uh, uh, person's a huzzy and you just, oh, they're no good and just, just, just writing them off right uh, until you find out that their mama was one and their grandmother and they came up in all that stuff and nobody taught them how to dress. No, no, nobody taught her how to uh, put on a foundation or to how to properly wear a slip or how to dress and you just assume that person's not safe and you write them off but as time passes they learn. See, in God, when you learn better, you do better. They learn and they grow and they get it together. And there you go, having passed judgment before the time. And, 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 and they get to Jesus before you do. They pass you in the rapture. 
Because the Lord is trying to decide whether or not to just <laughs> drop your back down. <laughs> <laughs> it's good teaching here. And every man, see, then, and then shall every man have praise of God. That is, uh, every man will get what the Lord has for them. You have to be careful how we write people off. What our Lord is speaking against here is he is saying that we are to avoid uh, amongst ourselves uh, as believers, as people, being censorous. Censorousness is not good. To be censorous is to be a believer or a person who, who is inclined to find fault. That is not a calling. I met a preacher one time who said, God uh, called me to be a, a troubleshooter. I look for trouble. I never invited him. That's not a biblical calling. You, listen, if you are that kind of person, please, please let the Lord deliver you. Because people like that are miserable. They're the most unattractive people. Because they sit around and try to find Things that are wrong. If it's wrong, you find it. If it's wrong in the person, you see it. A hundred things can go right. The 101st thing didn't fire quite right. And you, oh, you caught it. You key on that. That's the way you are. Well, you become a person who is very unattractive. You become a person who has, you repel people. You become an individual, uh, it makes you then naturally suspicious of people. And let me tell you something, nothing is more unattractive like being distrusting. And you become an individual who is ultimately always unhappy. Because there is fault in the world. Society is, is, is we live in a fallen world. We live in a sin-cursed world. And you don't have to look far in the world. You don't have to look far, uh, look hard to find fault in anything or in anyone. No one is without fault. So, he says, avoid being censorous. You set up on your perch and watch and you, you inspect the people to see who's right and who's wrong. Like you're qualified. You're not the watchman. You're not a shepherd. You're not the pastor. You're not the leader. And then the Lord didn't call the leader to do all that. I try to find out as little as possible. So I can be free to preach. Like I'm preaching this. I haven't, I haven't heard anything bad on anybody. So I wonder who is, who is he after. All of us. The Lord told me to preach uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm not, I, nobody in particular. I'm teaching you what the Bible says so you'll know what the Lord was saying versus what, what he wasn't saying. Avoid being censorous. Avoid prejudgment or prejudice. When we are prejudiced, we, we prejudge. That is, we come to conclusions about people without knowing the facts. See, this is, see, this is where we part company with the world. See, the, 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 the liars, the cheaters, the homosexuals, the left, they say to us, don't judge me. Well, when we tell them they're wrong, we're not judging them. There are acts that are wrong. There's no right way to be a pervert. There's no right way for a man to marry a man. There's no right way to commit adultery. There's no right way to steal. There's no right way to lie. So if a person actually did those things and you call them that, you have not judged them. It's judgment only when you assume that they have done something that way. Done that. And you go on an assumption without knowing anything about them. This is what the Lord speaks against. So and so is a certain kind of way. I just discern it in my spirit. Please. Because I know this, you, you know, these discerners, it's amazing what they don't discern. 
Why can't you discern that devil standing right beside you? Oh, I hope you come to church next Sunday. It's good. And then bring, and bring somebody with you. <laughs> you got to grow to where you can't, you, your goal is just not to bring yourself. Jesus, when he says judge not, he said avoid stereotyping. You can't assume that just if you're black and just because a person is white and you had a run-in with a white person, but you didn't have a run-in with that white person, but you've had a run-in with a white person or white persons, you can't assume that all white people hate you. And you can't assume a white person that just because you ran into a problem with a black person that all black people hate you or just because somebody was white, black, or Hispanic and they broke into your house you can't, or stole something from your place of business, you can't assume that not all blacks steal or all whites steal or all Hispanics steal. This is what the Lord's warning against. Just because you met somebody one time who shouted in the church and danced and praised the Lord, then you met them after service and found out they were crazy, you can't assume all shouters are crazy. <laughs> I know of doctors, lawyers, pilots, uh, accomplished businessmen, accomplished businesswomen who dance in the spirit, who dance and praise the Lord. Can I get a witness? And, 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 and they're highly intelligent. Stereotyping. Are you with me? You don't like this kind of talk today. <laughs> judgment. Illegitimate judgment. It's really, I'll tell you what it really is. It's really ego tripping. For we usually judge others to make us feel better about ourselves. I don't like him. I don't like her. I don't like him. He speaks with too much authority. She's mean. We judge them and we feel better about ourselves by putting them down. But remind, let me, I want to read something. It says, but when one develops a judgmental attitude, they estrange others. They hinder spiritual development. And lastly, they create a certain reaction. What is the reaction? The Lord says, judge not. Here's the reaction. Lest you be judged. See, when you're censorous, when you stereotype, when you do these things to other people, you invite these same things to you. That is a built-in law of reciprocation. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now, if you can't take it, don't dish it out. If you can't take the magnifying glass of scrutiny being applied to your life, drop your magnifying glass. Well, I'm just trying to see. I'm studying. All right? Well, why are you looking through the magnifying glass at somebody? Someone else is looking through that glass right at you. That's, that's actually what he's saying. And that's part of it. Judge not, lest you be judged. For whatever, for judgment you meet, that will come back to you. You can't stand off and be elitist and hold your head up like you are an authority. And not expect people to apply the same thing to you. Some of us are elitists and, and, and barely come to church. I don't know, I don't know why, how you think you're that spiritual. Just know, know more than Isaiah knew. And barely come to church. Hallelujah. You know, myself, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't participate in stuff like that. I'm not that kind of a person. See, let me tell you, this is the kind of person I am. Oh, no, man, you sit there for 40 minutes. You would think that they were talking about Jesus because every uh, uh, attribute they gave concerned themselves, every virtue, everything is just perfect. And don't nobody share that opinion of them but themselves. That's what he's warning against. 
This is good preaching. Amen. Rocket don't go far. I'm going to have to tune it up a little bit. I got to give him something. This is good preaching. See, it, 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 here's what it does. Because keep in mind now, Paul says, every man shall give an account of himself to God. So since you're going to give an account of yourself to God on the day, in the day of judgment, don't you think that we ought to begin to spend more time looking inwardly? And less time watching everyone else? You think, you think, you think my brothers, you think my brothers, all the guys who are married, you think our marriages would be better if we paid more attention to ourselves and what we're not doing than to our wives and what they're not doing. And wives, do you think that it would be a little better off if you paid more attention to yourself and what you're not doing than to him? Now, if the husband is of the opinion that he can't do any better, it's because he's just right. And if the wife is of the opinion that she can't do any better because she's got it all right, both need to call a lawyer. Because it won't be long before this marriage ends. What was the reason Jesus gave for the for the for the, 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 the uh, for divorce? It wasn't that people couldn't get along. Hardness of heart. What is hard? How does that work with this? A unwillingness to change. A unwillingness willingness to see yourself. You would rather let the house fall in. You'd rather let someone else raise your children. You'd rather let some let your marriage go kaput than to come down. Hardness of heart. Hear me today. Hear me today. Judge not, lest ye be judged. It is strange when we, when we use illegal, illegitimate judgments. It repels people, hinders spiritual growth, and create a, a bad reaction. Let me, just, let me just share this with you. John G. Butler talked about this uh, reciprocation. That the actions that we put out. He said the consequences of prejudice if you pre prejudicely, if you judge prejudicely, you can expect the same or expect to experience the same in return. Are you with me? He said, judge not lest you be not judged. For what judgment you meet, which judgment you judge, it shall be given to you. Let me quote, tell you what uh, John MacArthur said. He says, most people feel free to judge others like this because they erroneously think they are superior, somehow superior to others. When we assert our right to judge, we imply that we are qualified, end of quote. Also, someone else says this, when we assert our right to judge, we will be judged by the same standard of knowledge and wisdom that we claim is ours. Romans, follow me now, chapter 2. I'm enjoying this. I'm learning. This kind of, you know, preaching this kind of sermon will have an effect on you. Uh, studying for it will have one too. You'll be, you be repenting all through the message. Lord, oh. Bam, bam, bam. Beware of anybody who's never found in the Word. Beware of any person, no matter what you preach. Oh, I, I got that check. Check. You got all the boxes checked. Most of the time, the person who can have all the boxes checked have none of the boxes checked. Watch this. Romans, Romans chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art, that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, Thou condemnest thyself. Not the act of judging, but here's why he says this. Thou condemnest 
thyself for thou that judgest doest the same thing. Now, you can't condemn the man if you're doing the same thing that the man who you just condemned is doing. Now the solution is not, well I'm not gonna condemn, I'm not gonna judge. No, the solution is get holy and get to where you can say something because standards must be preached. Thank you for those three claps. You know I'm telling you the truth. Look at this, he says, uh, but we are sure that the judgment of God, only God's judgment, is according to truth against them which commit such things. And then he says this, he drives it home. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things. And the such things he talked about is Romans chapter one, men leaving the men and getting with other men and women leaving women, uh, men and getting with women and turning the truth of God into a lie and all that kind of stuff, ignoring God and failing to appreciate God. He says, thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and those things are wrong and doest the same that thou shall escape the judgment of God. He says, do you think that you're going to judge them who are doing this stuff, and if you're doing the same thing, you're going to escape God's judgment? No way. No way. This is good, isn't it? No way. You can't even, no matter how wrong they are, and no matter how true what you're saying is, if you're doing the same thing, then the, the judgment that you pronounce on them, you've also pronounced it on yourself. You know, I, I feel the pushback today. But let, me, let me swim a little more. See, you, 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 you got to, you, as saints, we've got to watch it because we are the standard bearers. And nothing hurts our cause like the standard bearer being caught up in the same thing that he's been bearing the standard concerning. Now, in one area, uh, Brother Wooden and the LGBTQXYZ community agree upon. 100%. You are not going to slip and tip and be with us and then preach against us. Amen. See, I, thought, I think they ought to out everybody who does that. Amen. In other words, you're not going to screw us and then turn around and screw us. That's good preaching. Look at your neighbor. I hadn't asked you to talk to your neighbor all day. Tell your neighbor, practice what you preach. That's what the Lord is saying. The warning is, judge not, lest you be judged. Well, if you're walking upright, when the world comes after you, you can stand up under the pressure. Can I get a witness? He says, for the same measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Bear with me here. Then he asks a question that some of y'all hoped I wouldn't get to today. Why behold this? The mote, verse 3, in thy brother's eye. This is a metaphor or simile. He's really not talking about mote or eye. He's talking about your brother's soul. But he uses this to illustrate a point. He said, why... Do you even notice the moat? One writer said that Jesus reached out and got a little sawdust from a man standing in the audience's eye. And others believe that the word uh, moat literally means a twig or a little stick, something that's too big for the eye, but small. Uh, 
how do you notice that twig or that mote in your brother's eye? But you don't consider the two by four or that log that's in, King James said, beam, your own eye. So can you see the imagery there? A man with a two by four stuck in his eye is passing judgment on someone else with a little sawdust in their eye. Now, does that make sense to you? See, the point here is that, and it's often the case, uh, that uh, the sin of the critic is greater than the sin of the person he is criticizing. That should never be. That should never be. That should never. Be. That hurts the cause. When the when the critic is walking in more wickedness than the person that they are criticizing, because you can't help them. He said, "Why? How? Why are you trying to even get the log out of their eye? Because see, you got a problem." See, I don't want a blind surgeon operating on me. I'm laying there, the man come in, he's a surgeon with a patch on his eye. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's time for me to get out of this bed. Pray, wait, wait a minute, doc. Can you see? Because this is surgery now. This is not, uh, <laughs> you get ready to operate on my eyes and one of your eyes. But I want a doctor with two, preferably four eyes, and then get that, that machine where he can look through the thing and it magnifies my eyes some more because these are my eyes and I can't play with my eyes. I have one soul. And if I should die and my soul is lost, there are no do-overs if you lose your soul. You don't get a chance to get it uh, fixed over again. So we need somebody working on us who can see clearly. That, that's, that's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus said, first of all, before you try to get that moat out of your brother's eye, get, get the log out of your own because you, you can't see. You might cut his throat. You might cut his ear off. Brother laying there and the nose is missing because while you were aiming at the eye, see, you got a log in your eye, so you got a problem. Your method uh, of deliverance was off. This is why I have these songs. There's no deliverance in them. You, you, got, you, got a, you got a bound person writing the song, even if they're writing it about Jesus. There's no deliverance in that. That's the problem with Snoop Dogg. No deliverance. He can't get you delivered. He's not delivered. You got to get delivered yourself. You can't point me to a cross that you hadn't found. You can't tell me about a Jesus who you do not know. You got to get delivered your first, first yourself. I heard Jesus when he told Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. See, today we ought to ask God, Lord, what on my eyes? Mm, work on my sight, Lord. I got a beam in my eye, and uh, I'm not trying to kill my brother. I'm, I'm trying to help him, but I'm, I'm really not qualified. Oh, Lord, every worker in the church ought to ask God to examine us. Bring me up a little bit right here. Praise the Lord, because see, you, you can't work the altar. You can't, praise the Lord, be on the mother's board. You can't be a good missionary. You can't be a good elder. And you can't be a good pastor. With a log stuck in your own eye. For even though we may try to help somebody else, 
the problem is we'll be off because we can't see clearly. Good God Almighty, we won't pray the right prayer. We won't fast at the right time because we can't see clearly. But if you let God work on you in the right order, here's the right order. Work on me, Lord. Ah, Lord! Work on me. Work on my mind. Work on my heart. Work on my spirit. God, get that log out of my eye because I want to help my brothers. I want to help my sisters. I want to be an encouragement to somebody. I want to live in a manner where the world will love you because of something I've said, but I can't be effective until he break every yoke and break every chain in my own life. Ah, somebody go to lift your hands and say, Lord, ah, Lord, get that log out of my because I want to see clearly too many things are going on in the world. We're aborting our babies. Our sons are being turned out. Our marriages are failing. Trouble is around every corner. The devil is busy. And God, you've got to have somebody, somebody to use somebody to operate through. Well, here I am volunteering my services. Lord, here I am. Use me. But in order to use me, I got to let him get the law out of my so that I can see clearly. Yeah. How many want to see clearly? How many want to see clearly so that you can help somebody else will lift your hands and let's start at home and say Lord work on me Lord Lord work on me work on my mind work on my heart work on my spirit set me free so that I can win somebody else I got friends, I got brothers, I got family members. There are people in my neighborhood who needs the cross, who needs salvation, who need to be delivered. I can't help them until the log is removed from my eye. Say yeah, yes. Somebody praise the Lord in here. at the club if you're at the club. We can't win them when our sin is greater than they. When the lifestyle of the standard bearer is worse than the people who are listening. You can't win them. Can't help them. This is what the Lord is saying. Can't do it. You know why? Because you can't see clearly. You need to be able to see. You need to be able to see. See, some of you, 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 you're trying to do too much blind. You need to be able to see. Church workers, we need to be able to see. Saints, we need to be able to see. And we can't see if that log is jammed in our own eye. And you really can't help anybody if you haven't even, you have, you haven't even noticed it.
I don't even see this tendency. I don't even see this thing. The Bible says, who can understand their errors? Psalms 19. Lord, keep back thy servant. <clears throat> Excuse me. From secret faults. Secret faults are not the secret sins and things we do uh, and we keep them undercover. Secret faults are faults that we have that we are not aware of. Lord, deliver me from faults that I have that I'm not aware of. I don't see it. I just don't. And Paul said, even though there are no charges being filed against me, that doesn't mean that none should be. I don't see it. I'm done. Different kind of sermon today. I don't want to spend too much time trying to make it into what it is not. It's not a jubilistic message. In these last days, the Lord wants to use us to help get the moat, the beam, and everything else out of other people's eye. But we can't do it until we allow the Lord to get the beam out of our own. Our community needs us. Every pew needs to be over time filled with a new convert. Somebody who previously don't know the Lord. I'm not talking about just recycling them from somebody else's church, but there are people out there. But because we have so many things in our eyes, we can't see clearly. We don't even see the lost amongst us. That's why most of us don't witness to people. We don't even know what witnessing is. We think witnessing is, I want to invite you to my church to hear my pastor preach. I mean, that's good to invite them, but people need to know who Jesus is. Who wants the Lord to work on their sight? Meet me at the altar.